Good evening, everyone. My name is Costandia Costandino. I am the H. Cotton Rogers III, Vice Provost and Director of the Penn Libraries. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you back to the Penn Libraries Pavilion. This is our very first public lecture in 2021. And welcome. <laughs> and welcome to those who are joining us virtually. A leading strategy for the Penn Libraries is expanding global impact through intentional and effective engagements with institutions, individuals, and communities. We inspire critical inquiry and creative expression through our exhibitions, events, and programming like tonight's event. The AWS Rosenbach Lecture are the longest running lecture series of its kind on the subject of bibliography in North America. The series began in 1931 with Christopher Marley, the first Rosenbach Fellow. And this evening, we are honored with the presence and attendance of three distinguished past Rosenbach lecturers, Peter Stalibra. All right. <laughs> James Green virtually joining us, and William Zacks. Welcome all. The lecture series was delayed for over 18 months due to the pandemic. And I would like to offer my profound thanks to our ever patient lecturer, Professor Michael Suarez, who had fully expected to deliver his lectures in March of 2020. Thank you, Professor Suarez, and welcome to Penn. The title of his lectures, uh, Printing Abolition, how the fight to ban the British slave trade was won 1783 to 1807. Professor Suarez's lectures would trace the production and distribution of abolitionist print, but more importantly, he will speak of the hidden networks that sustain the first humanitarian mass media campaign. In doing so, he will make an explicit argument on behalf of bibliography and book history's capacity to rewrite established narratives and to recover lives and labors typically left out of conventional accounts. To complement this year's Rosenbach lectures, I would like to thank our friends and our good colleagues at Haverford College, and specifically in this case, Ms. Sarah Horowitz, Head of Special Collections. Sarah has organized a pop-up exhibition of several items which provide some of the material evidence for Professor Suarez's lectures. And these items can be viewed following the lecture in the Lee Library just across outside of the pavilion. Thank you, Sarah, for your time and what you spend on preparing the exhibition. I also would like to thank the committee chair, David McKnight, for his service on the committee during the past 12 years. And to acknowledge the other members of the committee, Professor Reda Copland, James Green, curators John Pollack, Daniel Tracer, Jerome Singerman, and Professor Peter Stalibras. Thank you all for your steadfast working organizing this distinguished annual lecture for so many years. And at this point, I would like to introduce Professor Stalibras, who will introduce our Rosenbach lecturer this evening. Peter Stalibras is the Walter H. and Leonard C. Annenberg Professor Emeritus in the Humanities and Professor Emeritus of English at the University of Pennsylvania. He's also the founder and longtime director, now Emeritus, of the workshop in history of material text. Peter's passion and enthusiasm are legendary. And over the years, he has collaborated on research with scholars across the humanities and sciences. His course on the Bible of histories of reading at the Rare Book School is taught here at the Kislak Center with the Penn Library senior curator, Lynn Farrington, using materials 
from the collections as well as images taken during the visits from hundreds of other museums and libraries over the years. It is my pleasure to welcome Peter to introduce tonight's Rosenbach speaker, Michael Soares. Welcome. So not to take away from Michael's glory, but I feel I should begin by wishing John Pollock a happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday, John. <laughs> And secondly, I have disappointing news. I was actually told to give the uh, boring uh, introduction because Roger Chartier is gonna tell more personal anecdotes on Thursday. So you should wait for Thursday to hear all the scoop uh, on Michael. Uh, and mine is, I'm afraid, a more, a more dull affair. Although it's hard to be dull about Michael. Uh, Michael Suarez is a Jesuit priest and director of Rare Book School at the University of Virginia, where he is university professor and honorary curator of special collections. He has held research fellowships from the American Council of Learning Societies, the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard. He previously taught at Fordham and at Oxford University, where he studied as a graduate student with Don McKenzie and he received his PhD there. He has continued to honor Don McKenzie's extraordinary legacy on both sides of the Atlantic co-editing Don's essays, uh, Making Meaning, Printers of the Mind, and Others' Essays. Michael has been one of the most learned and influential voices in the history of the book for the last three de decades, and in many, many ways he's found, helped to found that uh, field altogether, both in Europe uh, and in the United States. His unrivaled knowledge of the 18th century English book trade is reflected, I should say the British uh, uh, book trade, is reflected in the Cambridge history of the book in Britain, volume five, 1695 to 1830, which he co-edited, uh, while his ability to see the global implications of the book is brilliantly captured in the Oxford companion to the book and in the book, A Global History, both co-edited with Henry Woodhausen. The latter is a monumental achievement, bringing together an extraordinary range of scholarship in a million word reference book of over 1,400 pages. The Sunday Telegraph in London called it colossal and quote, a paradise for book lovers, while the Wall Street Journal praised it as a fount of knowledge where the internet is but a slot machine. Three of his recent books have been named by the Times Literary Supplement as books of the year. Michael is editor-in-chief of the Oxford Scholarly Editions Online, one of the largest digital programs, uh, humanities projects extant today, as well as co-editor of the eight volume Oxford University Press edition of the collected works of Gerard Manley Hopkins, for which he co-edited the Dublin Notebook. And in 2014 to 15, he gave the, the J.R. Lyle readership uh, in lectures, sorry, in, in bibliography at Oxford University on the reach of bibliography. For more than two decades, Michael has been the most active and stimulating supporter of Penn's history of material texts, where he is the only person apart from Roger Chartier to give annual presentations. His dazzling talks have taken in everything from lost books to the presence of an extraordinary range of material objects in early modern libraries, which makes one completely rethink what a library was, uh, including, by the way, uh, the Library Company of Philadelphia, which much of what was used to be there, huge range of equipment um, it, and, and skulls, all sorts of other things uh, was part of their collection. Uh, but he's also done a, a wonderful talk on the problem is of what color is your fish? Uh, and also talked wonderfully about the editing of Alexander Post, Pope, Pope. He is also a co-editor of the Material Text series, with Jerry, which J Jerry Singerman founded at the University of Pennsylvania Press. This week, Michael is giving the Rosenbach Lectures in Bibliography on printing abolition, how the fight to ban the British slave trade was won, 1783 to 1807. Starting this evening and continuing tomorrow, and on Thursday at 5.30 here in the Kislak Center. Michael's lecture tonight is entitled Feeding the Machine, a Triple System of Networks. 
please join me in giving the warmest of welcomes to the kindest, most generous, and most challenging of the many friends of the sixth floor of the library, Michael Suarez. Thank you, Michael. Peter, that was above and beyond, even for you. I, I'm so pleased to be here and um, in such good company. I've been coming to the material text series for well nigh 20 years, and it's been such an important part of my own intellectual development. Um, this community, I'm fond of saying, is, is the, the most powerful book historical community in the United States. And it's certainly been incredibly nurturing for me as it has been for so many. And um, the sixth floor gang has been transformative in the study of the history of the book. And we owe them a debt that we could never really repay. Uh, uh, the lecture that I'm going to give tonight has its origin in a lecture I gave here as part of the material text series in 2013 and that I reprised in 2015 as the third Lyle lecture, Proliferating Images, a study of the slave ship Brooks. And essentially I was trying to figure out how bibliography could account for the ways we got from this in 1787 to this in 1853. Uh, so, so I've been working on, on this abolition print idea for a very long time. And when David very kindly approached me in May of 2016 and said, we'd like you to give the Rosenbox in 2020, it was very clear to me that I wanted to talk about abolition print so that I could uh, learn more about the networks that contributed to the production of uh, print. Print as the site of contestation. Uh, and I've been uh, imbricated in many archives and libraries. And I would like to begin by thanking the librarians uh, in the Anglo-American world, particularly who have been so generous with their time and expertise in helping me try to come to a deeper understanding. I'm trying to understand a little bit more deeply what the affordances of bibliography and book history capaciously conceived could do for the understanding of a well-studied phenomenon, the abolition of the slave trade in 1807 and how we got there. Print is the site of contest. Print is the way that this happened over and again. And it seemed to me that while many excellent historians had studied the abolition of the slave trade and indeed the eventual abolition of slavery in Britain, I wondered what would happen if we tried to bring the, the uh, possibilities of bibliography and book history onto the scene in a moral contest for the soul of the nation. So our story begins in 1785 with a prize essay at the University of Cambridge. Is it lawful to enslave another person against their will? And the winner, not surprisingly, was Thomas Clarkson, who had won the year before. He was merely trying to pile up prizes so that he could um, get a good preferment as a clergyman. And, uh, and then it came to him, well, wait a minute. If I wrote this essay and the things in the essay are true, I need to devote my life to emancipating these enslaved men, women, and children. What was he up against? Between 1750 and 1800, British flagged ships transported 1.5 million human beings from the west coast of Africa to the New World, as many as 
12, perhaps 10% of them died during the Middle Passage. And there was big, big, big money involved. With the loss of the North American colonies, or at least the United States, and before uh, India was fully monetized, the sugar colonies were the cash cow. Four billion pounds per annum, all the other British colonies only one billion. Now along comes this punk from St. John's College, Cambridge, who's written a Latin essay and says, I'm going to try to stop this. What can I do? How can I get it done? And he, he gathers around a group of Quakers, William Dillwyn and uh, James Phillips and some others who have been working on this problem really since the early 1780s. And uh, James Phillips, the publisher, uh, his, his uh, printing works has been obliterated long since, but um, here in George Yard off Lombard, Lombard Street, they, they met and, and they end up publishing his book, uh, a translation from the Latin with additions. And you can see it's, it's long, it's not particularly stylish, it's expensive. Who's gonna read this? Hmm. But it's a start. And because of Clarkson's enthusiasm, they start to form a bigger committee, a real committee. They have been doing the work already. Dilwyn, John Lloyd, uh, study the case of the oppressed, ooh, study the case of the oppressed Africans. I'm, I apologize. And they've been having a Quaker slave trade committee since 1784. And, and now they're going to make a more secular abolition committee. And so, and so uh, they've already been in the business of publishing and they convoke a group of friends, 12 businessmen, nine of whom are Quakers. And the committee's work is, is to procure such information and evidence for distributing Clarkson's essay on other publications that tend to the abolition of the slave trade. Right from the beginning, this is about procuring evidence and publishing. And this becomes really important, this twin remit. Uh, right away, uh, from the very beginning, they say, okay, let's Let's publish this new publication, a summary view of the slave trade. Let's publish this little single one sheet thing. And here it is. It's, it's, um, it's, it's kind of an infomercial for the newly formed committee. And uh, you see, they give the names of the committee, they solicit subscriptions, and it's, it's really very basic. Slaves are acquired by means of war is how they begin. And it's uh, 16 pages in all, single sheet, 2,000 copies. And that's how this nation enterprise begins. But actually, that's not the first piece of print. They say, encouraged by the success, we're going to have this society because we've been publishing other publications. And now we're going to get going, well and good. But they know full well, in order to do that, they need to raise money. And the first piece of print that the society produces is actually a subscription list. They're raising funds. And, and um, you can see uh, an analysis, um, very interesting that the, the, the very fine classic scholar, Elizabeth Carter is there, James Christie, the, the auctioneer, uh, Viscount Galway, John Johnson, the publisher, Josiah Wedgwood, um, the, the list is impressive and it will grow over time. Uh, and they begin to fight in the public press the war against the status quo. So here we see the moral enormity, if you will, 
of the Reverend Harris who says, but of course scripture says that you can be slaves. And they answer that right away again and again and again. James Ramsey comes hard on Harris and they fight it out in a series of pamphlets. Uh, you can see here in the list of the society, this is a, the most extended subscription list. Uh, this society was formed in order to uh, bring public attention to the slave trade, collect evidence, and um, we're going to go to parliament and get the law changed. This serves as a kind of directory of who's who. And here's an analysis of the nearly 2,000 names, their origin, their subscription amounts, what abolition societies they belong to. You can see the dominance of London here, but you can also see how important the provincial towns are. One of the important things to bear in mind here is abolition of the slave trade happens when it happens, far distant from this date not because of 12 men in London, but because of people spread all over the UK, because of men and women in Philadelphia, because of people in Savannah, Georgia, and Charleston, and in New York. It is not, not true at all that the abolition of the slave trade happens because of the actions of a group of men who are uh, pretty savvy and pretty hardworking in London. It's a much broader network that we have to countenance if we really wanna understand what's happening. So the, the triple remit of the committee is to of course raise money, it's to collect the evidence and, and then to uh, bring uh, living testimonies to London to testify before both houses of parliament. This becomes a major expense of the committee as they strive to uh, uh, get parliament to understand from eyewitness testimony in a forensic way, what the middle passage in particular was like, and also what the treatment of slaves in the sugar colonies actually was despite the fictitious narratives of many of the owner. So they're going to print. One of the things that they print uh, in very large numbers is the Dean of Middleham's letter. And um, this is kind of typical uh, in many ways. Clarkson says, we love this because it was the result of local knowledge. Uh, Nichols was born in the West Indies, and he was able to talk about particular sugar plantations and how people were treated there, which ones were good, which ones were bad, why the slave trade wasn't necessary for the flourishing of the colonies, and why the British system would be much, much better if all men and women were free. They love this eyewitness testimony, this forensic, uh, I was there, this is what I saw, this is the name of the owner, this is the name of the colony, and so on. But equally important is something that's kind of invisible unless you go into the committee records, and that is the distribution network. And here you can see Manchester, Birmingham, York, Bristol, uh, Rotherham, Sheffield, Nottingham, Exeter, Norwich, Oxford, Lincoln, St. Ives, Shrewsbury, Cambridge, Chesterfield, Ipswich, and so on. There is a network in place for the massive distribution of print. And so we learn from Thomas Clarkson that the initial distribution list had 116 names and 70% of them were provided by the Quaker printer, James Phillips, who's kind of the hero of our story this evening anyway. And if you go into the Society of Friends Library uh, in Euston Road in London, you can find this document, which is from the Quaker Committee, which is the antecedent committee, and what do you see? Distribution lists 
the underwriters at Lloyd, the mayor and alderman, the Africa company, Hudson Bay, uh, London Assurance, and so on. And they, they're going to list all the insurance brokers. They're going to have all the magistrates in Kent. They're going to have the, the dissenting clergy in Suffolk. And it goes on and on and on like this in a way that they are able to figure out who's who. And they annotate these lists. Who dies? Who's receptive? Who changes his address? And they get print to specific targeted people over and over again. It's the distribution network that changes everything. It's easy to document the production of print, as you will see. It's pretty easy to follow the money, as you will see. It's much more fugitive to find the archival evidence of distribution. But the Quakers were pack rats, and they kept everything. And so there's actually a lot of evidence distributed around the archives, if you dig deeply enough, about this crucial element of distribution and the network that the distribution of print formed. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is a deeply synergistic process because the print distribution network helps feed the fundraising network, which helps feed the gathering of evidence network and, and it just feeds on itself. Uh, success breeds success. So uh, really important to understand that what's happening in, in before the committee, the, the much vaunted committee, is a continuation of what the Quakers were already doing. I don't think that's sufficiently acknowledged. Uh, it's merely a kind of secularized committee with a broader reach and um, uh, more marquee people in it for the purposes particularly of fundraising. So there's a kind of a continuity. It's also true that if eventually, it takes them 20 years, the committee succeeds, it's partly because they have a number of advantages, some of which I would like to delineate for you this evening. One of them is the existence of the Pennsylvania Abolition Society, who push and push and push the London Abolition Society to be more creative and more aggressive and who are feeding knowledge and information to the London Society in this kind of steady back and forth exchange that becomes really important. Here is a, a good example. This uh, Clarkson essay on the impolicy of the African slave trade, James Phillips, our man here, very typical publication. It gets sent to Philadelphia. It becomes republished by subscription. The copies get bound. They get put in the local public library for consultation. This becomes a very typical kind of strategy. The transatlantic network must be countenanced if we really want to understand why abolition succeeds. They're not working alone by any means. It's also true that they have some pretty shrewd backers. Josiah Wedgwood was himself the clandestine angel of the Quaker committee. And so he starts out slowly, but he becomes their main financial or one of their main financial backers for the abolition committee. He also quite famously uh, helps to design the famous emblem here for the mass media campaign that's so recognizable, but very important to acknowledge, I think that it's really, it's really not Wedgwood, it's probably his main modeler at the, at the pottery, William Hackwood. So um, also pushing the abolition committee in London and teaching them is the Manchester committee. They're much more aggressive. They're much more innovative than the Londoners. The Londoners are kind of, um, 
They have a governor on the engine, if that makes sense to anybody who remembers uh, the governor on the engine. And that, and that governor is Wilberforce, who's conservative with a capital C, and he's evangelical. He doesn't want to rock the boat. William Pitt is his classmate. He also happens to be the prime minister. He, he wants to go slowly. The Manchester committee want to go fast, and they want to go hard and and they they teach over and again they teach the london committee how to be their best and i would argue most aggressive selves um, a good example would be that thomas cooper immediately resorts to the public press and and gets things in the newspapers fast and then has the the noose as they say in the north to um to uh, reprint those in a separate publication and distribute those widely. This becomes a pattern in London, but not until Manchester does it first. So if we look at the first 15 month period of the abolition committee, 80,000 printed items in 15 months, not including the ones that they buy in, they're buying copyrights, they're buying other people's extant publications and distributing them. 80,000 items in 15 months. That is a remarkable thing and beautifully, beautifully delineated here. Um, when we look a little bit further on in the minute book, we see that, okay, they printed 80,000, mas o menos, but they, they had almost 15,000, 14.5 thousand left over. So, all right, they distributed more than 65,000 items because printing is not the same as distribution. Printing doesn't ensure reception. So they distributed more than 65,000 items in a 15 month period. They could have never done that without a network, with, with a lot of uh, lieutenants in the field, many of whose names we do not know, but who certainly worth the effort of, of sedulous historical recovery, because the distribution network, I believe, not just the print production, is the key to everything. It's also true that the time is uniquely propitious. Lackington, the bookseller, says all ranks and degrees now read. That's probably not entirely true, um, but there are a lot of literate adults. Uh, this is kind of a, a high-end estimate, 3.4 million literate adults uh, in, in the UK. Here's, here's a low-end estimate from, from Edmund Burke, who says, well, the actual British public, the political public, is 400,000 men. Now, the truth is probably somewhere in between. We know Burke is, is, is very conservative in his estimate. But just imagine Burke is right for a second. If there are 400,000 men and you distribute 65,000 items of print and they get read and passed on, how many members of that British public are you influencing? It's hard to know. It's also true that the urbanization of the UK at this time is unprecedented. 57% of urban growth in Europe is taking place in the UK at the end of the 18th century. And that urbanization allows for print distribution, allows for the mobilization of those abolition committees, enables the very possibility of, of this committee having any hope of success. It's also true that when we read the great Roger Chartier about the, the efflorescence of uh, political ideas at the advent of the French Revolution, Roger reminds us that the proliferation of print, the growth of personal libraries, uh, is really important. The change in the social habits of regular reading. And if that's true in France, it's all the more true in the UK at this time. So 
Another help that the committee has for its success comes from a very unlikely quarter. This is William Elford, who comes from a banking family and who himself is a principal in a marine bank. And he becomes the president of the Plymouth Abolition Committee. And he has everything to lose. He should be a national hero for his moral courage. He hazards his family business to do this. Elford was a fellow of the Royal Society, and he was also great friends with William Pitt the Younger. William Pitt sent one Captain Parry of the British Navy to Liverpool to get the exact dimensions of nine British slave ships. And he could board all those ships because a captain in the Navy. So he takes all those measurements and he gives the list has it copied and he gives the list to Elford and Elford looks at it and he takes the first ship on the list, the slave ship Brooks. And it is Elford who creates the diagram of the slave ship that is so transformative. And uh, this has 1200 words, uh, quite a forensic description, but also with an emotional appeal. And uh, they get this in London and immediately they see its potential. And what do they do? The committee creates another committee. And, and the committee goes to improve what they got from Alford and, and they work on it. And this is what they, they produce seven weeks later. They produce the diagram of the slave ship Brooks that has not one image, but seven images, not 1,200 words, but 2,400 words with a table of data, a table of data, a table of data. It's a forensic appeal. It also is invested with eyewitness testimony, as we shall see. So they lowball very carefully. They lowball, they, they say, here are 487 men here. But in the last journey, 609. So they, they don't, they want to avoid any appearance of um, exaggeration. They're constantly being sober. They're constantly being evidential. They're constantly marshalling a kind of a legal evidentiary argument. This is very important to understand what the committee does and what the committee doesn't do. But they also desperately need that eyewitness testimony and the five men who are on the subcommittee to improve what Elford has done, have the resources of the London committee and a publication by Phillips and Alexander Falconbridge has made four trips as a surgeon on a slave ship before he gives up the trade because of its moral enormity. And it's Falconbridge's testimony that features most prominently in the diagram of the slave ship Brooks. Something we tend not to pay attention to is that this printed image is not just a picture. It's a picture with words that are suited for parliamentary testimony. It's a picture with words that will move the human heart, but also are suited to win carefully wrought evidentiary argument. So here you can see they print 1,700 from copper plate and 7,000 from wood. That's remarkable. So they make two, two the wood is, is cheap and fast. The copper plate is elegant and expensive, but is going to be for members of parliament, for more important, um, it's the VIP version, if you will. But it's also true that Wilberforce seizes upon the ship. He has a model made. He cuts out the, the, the print and pastes it in. This is print, this is a print object. It's a kind of decoupage for abolition, if you will. And he, he walks into the House of Commons and he walks into the opposition row and he puts the slave ship into the hands of the first opposition MP. And he says, 
So much misery condensed into so little room is more than the human imagination had ever before conceived. The remarkable thing to me is that the time from the receipt of the Plymouth diagram to the speech, 56 days, the kind of total transformation that this becomes the kind of bedrock of their argument. And the slave ship becomes the kind of uh, grounding of, of the way that they'll go forward. Uh, since we're in Philadelphia, I cannot omit to say that uh, Matthew Carey gets a copy for the American Museum, prints it up right away in, in the same month uh, that Wilberforce speaks. And um, the Pennsylvania Committee prints 2,500 of these, and, and they distribute them uh, not only up and down the coast, but also crucially, they bring them to New York and they distribute them in Federal Hall where the Congress of the United States of America is sitting. And they give them to the vice president, they give them to the president and so on and so forth. They make sure everybody sees this. You can see how the strategies are mutually informing. You can see how what's happening in the States is informed by what's happening in the UK. What's happening in the UK is informed by what's happening in the States. There is a synergy here that's really important. Clarkson is enamored of the French Revolution, which is just breaking out. He goes to Paris and he says, I've got to have this diagram. They print it up. Phillips prints it up for him. He sends them a uh, thousand of them or, and, um, and he says, the Arch Archbishop of Aix-en-Provence, when I first showed him the same plate, was so struck with horror that he could hardly speak. The power of this image becomes the calling card of the abolition movement internationally. It's also true that uh, the London Abolition Committee has learned a lot from that Manchester Committee about leveraging the public press. And they start to work with Woodfall here, who has this, this paper that's, that's really important. And there is one copy that I know of in the world in which we see the evidence from the 8th of May, 1789, that in the outer form, Woodfall produced his paper as usual. But in the inner form, the whole paper is taken up with the slave ship Brooks. One side with the diagram and one side with the letterpress that's now missing. So the mass distribution of this to an unwitting London public, imagine opening your daily newspaper and finding the image of the slave ship Brooks. And here is William Woodfall here, who, uh, who becomes absolutely instrumental, but is probably not one of our heroes because he's doing it for money. Nonetheless, absolutely essential. And he's doing it for some political risk. Please remember that these nine Quaker businessmen, Granville Sharp, they, they, have, no, they have no real social cachet, but the West Indian planters do. And so even somebody who's in the pay of the abolition committee is risking a great deal. They pay half a guinea for half a column. And, and uh, because Woodfall is supposed to have a tape recorder kind of memory, when parliament is sitting, it's the most read of any of all the London papers. And he prints about 3000 of them a day. And, and this becomes absolutely important and not sufficiently countenanced in the scholarly literature. Uh, Granville Sharp, the chairman of the committee, as they're trying to get petitions to the House of Houses of Parliament going, particularly the Commons, he says, this is great. This is going to uh, infuse the mind of the public. And uh, it's particularly useful when added to the blare of evidence. Layer 
of evidence. They try to build a, a forensic case that is irrefutable to enliven ordinary men and women to the enormities of the Middle Passage and the period of seasoning when slaves first come to the plantation and also die in huge numbers, to the punishments that slaves undergo, to the high mortality rate, and to the malnutrition under, uh, that they labor under in some plantations, and, 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 and. So the blare of evidence becomes particularly important. The secret weapon I would submit to you of the abolition committee is James Phillips, who, who is a factotum doing everything from purchasing copyrights and overseeing distribution to uh, serving on the rules committee of, of, of the abolition committee and so on and so forth. He brings in Clarkson, he brings in Wedgwood, he brings in Dixon. He, he becomes the kind of, I think, the unheralded linchpin. There's no likeness of him. There's no ODNB entry. Uh, there, there's nothing about him extant. Why? Because he's a printer because he's a Quaker, because he's nobody. But for this committee, this working man is the linchpin. So um, the conservatism of the abolition committee is not something we should be proud of. Uh, William Dixon comes to them. They don't know him. They don't know his pedigree. He's been the secretary to the governor of Barbados. You would think he would be the perfect witness. But because he doesn't have any formal letters of introduction, the abolition committee won't take him on. But James Phillips, the working man, says, I will take you on. The abolition committee won't publish your, your letters on slavery. I will publish them at my risk. And so he does. You can see that this eventually figures a little bit in American history because this copy in the Boston Public Library was owned by the great American abolitionist, William Lloyd Garrison. But it's a, it's a tremendous example, it seems to me, of Phillips trying to break out of the conservatism of the abolition committee. They're so afraid of offending the, the members of parliament because they need legislation. They need legislation. They're afraid of offending their benefactors. So, so um, a good example of that is uh, the thoughts and sentiments on the evil and wicked traffic of, of the slavery and commerce of the human species uh, by the Ghanaian Otoba Kugwango, which is published right as the committee is getting going in the summer of 87. And um, this is not a happy story. Uh, Kugwango is the first black abolitionist in the English speaking world. He publishes an account of his life, which should have become the primary document in some ways of the abolition committee. And yet, and yet it does not. There's no evidence of its patronage. There's no newspaper advertisement. There's no book review. There's no ad. There's no subscription list. There's no mention in a single diary or letter. And there's no mention in any abolition committee document. It's as if he doesn't exist. Now you would think that if they wanted somebody who was there, he was a slave, he became free, he knows how to write well, pretty well, very well, I would say. And he, he gives powerful testimony against slavery and the slave trade. Uh, it's particularly anomalous, it seems to me, because uh, uh, Kugwango, along with uh, Equiano, uh, was a member of the Sons of Africa, a group of black men in London, principally, and the surrounding counties. Who, who were a corresponding society, a lobbying group, and who used the newspapers vigorously to make their political point. Here they write a, a letter hailing the project of William Dixon. Also, Equiano, when he publishes his book two years later, manipulates the public press with great skill. 
So what's happening with Kugango? Well, um, I think it's partly a matter of his content. He says, if a man is enslaved and the only way he can become free is by enslaving his master, it is just to do so. He says, I call for a total abolition of slavery now. You must understand, ladies and gentlemen, that this former slave issues a kind of uh, invective against the society in which he lives. And everyone is afraid of the force of his rhetoric. The abolition committee is very, very careful to say, we're not going to abolish slavery. We're only going to abolish the trade. You can keep running your business just as you want, just you can't buy any more slaves. Fukuwango says, no. Great Britain cannot live like this. And because I think of his moral courage, in part, his moral honesty, no one will go near his book. There's been some confusion about the success of his book. Uh, these prospectuses for the book are sometimes confused to be editions. They're not. And um, something very strange happens. Here's what I take to be the first version of the prospectus. Beckett, bookseller in Pall Mall, Phillips, Causeway. Beckett is the bookseller to the Prince of Wales. Suddenly, while the type is still standing, he drops out. The list changes. Causeway is his patron. Phillips, of course, is our man. And Phillips seems to disappear from the scene as well. What's happening? It's very hard to know. The only index of reception we have is in the translator's preface to the French edition in which he says, uh, an Italian sends this to Paris and he says, Kuguango gave me his work, which has produced the greatest sensation in London. But of course, he's trying to sell copies. So, so we really don't know what happened. But what we do know is the abolition committee and its conservatism wouldn't go near it. Hmm. It's also true that there's a tremendous amount of print out there which we might call sentimental. And the committee won't go near that either. Uh, in 1792, three, one of the most popular songs uh, is, is the song, The Desponding Negro. The Negro slave breaks his chains and comes onto the deck of the ship to throw himself overboard. Lightning strikes him and blinds him. He, he, he's no good as a slave because he's blind. He gets taken to London and he begs in the street. Spare half penny, spare halfpenny, spare halfpenny for the poor Negro. And so, and so this, this becomes a kind of a, a trope, an important trope in, in the 1790s, and the committee won't go near it. They won't go near any of the sentimental publications. They want to be evidential. They want to be forensic. Uh, the petition of the sharks of Africa, uh, a fake petition, a spurious petition, I think which might be a commentary not only on the moral enormity of the slave trade, the sharks say, if you abolish the slave trade, you will be depriving us of our food, human flesh, when the slaves are thrown overboard. And, um, but I think it also may serve as a kind of a commentary on the conservatism of the committee as well. And uh, likewise, the petition of those who make uh, chains, whips, iron coffins, cattails, scourges, leg bolts, neck yokes, iron collars. If you abolish the slave trade, we as manufacturers of these instruments of restraint and torture won't be able to uh, exercise our trade. Completely spurious. Uh, there are a number of abolition satires, many more than, than are countenanced, and they are absolutely not part of the picture. They're simply not, not told. Um, they don't. Uh, so Clarkson 
is seeking evidence. In this case, he sends out a circular letter because he has the distribution network. And he says, don't tell anybody we're asking down here in London, but aren't there medical men who are on slave ships who I could come see? Aren't there, aren't there sailors who used to be on slave ships who we could enlist in our cause? Don't scare anybody off, but we could send some people up there and we could begin to get evidence for testimony before the Houses of Parliament. This becomes really important. Pray be earnest. Um, get, get people who you can, especially these medical men, uh, because we need these people to be evidences. Fascinating. There are two kinds of evidence. There's the printed book, and there's the living testimony of the person who appears before the commons. So I think that uh, nothing better shows the cascade of print and, and the evidentiary argument of the committee than uh, the abstract of the evidence uh, before the House of Commons. Here is the original version in uh, 1791. It's a substantial publication and, and people, as we'll see, beg for an abstract. Um, William Dillwyn in London says the question is lost. Uh, and one of the reasons why the question is lost is because we were trying to make this abstract for the members of the House of Commons but we spent too long making it and we only got the actual printed books to the members of the commons the day before the vote. Who's gonna read 160 printed pages the day before the vote? Printing history and parliamentary history go hand in hand if you dig enough in the archive. So lots of provincial printing in this case, um, uh, in, in Newcastle, a shortened version, much more economical, quite striking piece of print. And uh, here in Bury, near Manchester, going to serve uh, Greater Manchester, you see quite the opposite, a full treatment here. And you wonder, was there patronage? Was the press run very small? How did, how did that happen? Uh, here, here you see in, in Edinburgh, the Glasgow and Edinburgh societies in 91 uh, pool their money in order to be able to do this. And they say, if you wanna see more publications like this, you need, to, you need to help us. You need to help fund this work of the society. Um, and and uh, they publish another edition. And in all of these editions of the abstract of the evidence, there's always, 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 I've never found one where it didn't have it, the diagram of the slave ship with the dimensions and the discussion of what's taking place. So um, here we see the London abstract that's made its way uh, uh, up to Durham. And you can see as soon as this book is read, return it again to John Dixon and it turns out John Dixon in Durham is from a coal mining family and, and he's part of a Quaker group that's running an abolition lending library. The multiplication of readership, really important. So um, Wedgwood himself says, uh, they're preparing this abridgment of, of the evidence and their confidence that the trade only needs to be known to inspire an universal detestation of its cruelty and conviction of its injustice. So they want to diffuse these short works of authority among the people. And they're gonna publish actually several abridgments in different forms suited to different kinds of readers. Second abridgment is in prepare, is being prepared. And um, uh, the head of the Edinburgh committee who's in uh, London says to his people in Edinburgh, you need to publish extracts. Look what we're doing in Woodfall's register. You need to do the same in the Edinburgh papers. Again, this use of the newspapers becomes increasingly important. And of course, the, the transatlantic network here, 
20 abstract of the evidence and, and six abridgments of the same. This is going back and forth, really important. Catherine Plimley up in the north or in the Midlands says, uh, they've sent a copy of the abstract of the evidence to every clergyman throughout Scotland. They paste up a plan of the slave ship. The woodblocks were sent to Edinburgh for reprinting wherever they think it will be seen for, uh, by many. And they desire the clergy to spread the abstract as far as possible. So clergy in Edinburgh with their, with their Kirks, they become the distribution network. This is not unlike what the Methodist societies will do in the Midlands and the South. So um, one of the uh, things that gives me a great window into the distribution network is William Dixon. Remember the man who uh, Phillips rescued from oblivion by publishing his letters. Well, pretty soon the committee sees what a good thing he is. And um, he has a diary of his trip to Scotland to distribute print. And uh, this is a, a marvelous document. I distributed 12 abstracts among the Paisley gentlemen. They all earnestly recommended a two penny abstract as suiting every man's time and purse. Also a small cheap copy of the debates and so on. So, so they're saying, stop publishing these big things, give us small things. Um, uh, guy in Henley on Thames writes to James Phillips and says, send me 300 more of these summaries because I'm gonna send one to every prominent family in my district. This is how it happens. And when you uncover the distribution network, you can understand the valences of the consumption of print that are so crucial. Printing itself doesn't do anything. It's the printing and distribution, it's the collecting of the evidence, it's the synergies of the networks that become more and more important. Here is a, is a, a difficult, difficult image. Uh, this is, this is uh, an abstract of the evidence with these excerpts again and again with its accompanying uh, images and it becomes a kind of a handbill for display in a church, in a common house, in an inn, and so on. Uh, the abstract also has a lively time in the public press. And um, here you see uh, copies of the debates and abstracts of the evidence are to be seen in most of the coffee houses in Newcastle. And so they use the coffee houses as an engine of distribution too. And they're printing the abstract of the evidence in gobbets uh, as often as the papers come out all over the country. Um, that distribution network becomes essential for securing uh, the petitions, and they're going to send the abstract of the evidence to convince people. Um, so in 1788, the first petitioning campaign, 103 petitions signed by, hard to know, they're, they, they're not extant, maybe as many as 100,000. In 1791, an unprecedented 519 petitions are sent with maybe as many as 400,000 signatory. So there's Burke's, there's Burke's British public right there. Um, so just by comparison, the London Docks Bill, which was the most important economic bill of the era, 49 petitions, right? So you can see the power of the network. Why doesn't this succeed? It doesn't succeed partly because of the Haitian Revolution that starts in August uh, 14, uh, 1791, but it also doesn't succeed because the French Revolution instills a profound fear of Jacobin tendencies and uh, so much so that uh, the committee has to stop doing business because it's associated with radical corresponding societies that get banned by the government. And, um, and then when the king is killed, and France declares war on Great Britain, uh, then the abolitionists, many of whom are, are pro-French revolution, 
many of whom do have Jacobin tendencies, many of whom do love Paine's rights of man, the kind of Bible of the English version of this. They, they, they uh, really need to prescind altogether from the political sphere. And this brings the activities of the committee to a grinding halt. So let's, let's finish by looking at some quick analysis. Um, James Phillips, the printer. We can see what he was doing and how he was doing it here. The blue is his abolitionist publish, uh, publishing, uh, printing, and here is all the rest of that. Um, he's not just an abolitionist printer, but uh, when we look carefully at what he's doing, first by, by actual publications and then by edition sheets, we can see how, how this becomes an essential part of his activity. We can also see uh, here uh, the degree to which printing becomes central and then is supplanted by collection of the evidence. And so the impetus of the committee changes over time very importantly. The finances, uh, the proportion spent on printing goes down, the proportion spent on evidentiary collection and testimony before the Houses of Parliament go up. You can really, you can really see that here in the collection of evidence material. Here's printing. Here they're living off the fat of the land here. Um, so, so astonishingly, between May of 87 and the end of 92, the committee prints 577,000 sheets. Uh, this is remarkable output and hasn't been sufficiently accounted for bibliographically, it seems to me. Um, so you can, you can see that the, the the publications, I'm so sorry, the publications get longer here and just to close out, you can see a flurry of printing in the beginning to educate the people and then much more targeted longer format things here these are books, these are longer uh, uh, materials. Here, it's kind of a hodgepodge with a lot of um, establishing the brand with committee documents themselves. When we look at the, the output measured in sheets, you can really see that they change from a pamphlet business to a book business, things more than seven sheets long. Why? Because they've collected all this evidence and now they want to put it into the hands of the people who are in a position to change the slave trade. So we think of the great man theory of history again and again and again. And here for the anniversary of the abolition of the slave trade, the British government honors Granville Sharp and William Wilberforce and Thomas Clarkson, and that's great, and, and so they should. That's not the story. That's not the story. The story is more complex. The story is much more about networks. The story is more about the moral courage, not of three men, but of thousands of men and women who were part of the distribution of print, who were part of the funding of the activities of the committee, and not just the London committee, but all those provincial committees around the country. When we reduce what happened eventually to conduce toward the abolition of the slave trade to the activities of great men, we do a terrible injustice to the British public. We do a terrible injustice to what really happened. Part of the power of bibliography and book history is to reveal the truth of the story. 
In my next lecture, I'd like to try to use the affordances of book history to talk about the first great consumer boycott in history, a boycott of sugar and rum as products of the slave trade. And on Thursday, I'll talk about the countervailing force that the abolition committee was up against in the publication committee of the West Indian planters themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. At this time, we'll take some questions from the audience. I think what we're going to do is we'll do one question from the audience and one question from Zoom and go back and forth. So if anyone has a question in the audience, please raise your hand. Michael, this is going to be a very American question, but the time you're talking about is, is in the decade after 1776 and the War of Independence, and yet there seems to be such close ties between the Quakers on both shores. Can you talk about that a little bit? I can. Um, so, so there is a barrier, certainly, and there becomes more of a barrier when American flag ships continue to trade. And one of the arguments against establishing the slave trade is the French and the Americans will continue the trade and we won't be able to do anything about it. We will just suffer economically, right? So there are, there are certainly profound tensions, but the friends are moving, the Quakers are moving people and, and printed matter and even money back and forth at a great rate. And, and their, their common uh, religious and moral allegiance supersedes the divide between the two countries in, in pretty powerful ways. It's also true, I think, that um, uh, the war ends in, in 1782 and uh, the full committee with its international cooperation doesn't really start for five years later. So there's a kind of... Uh, a licking of wounds, I think, a kind of uh, an interval before things really start up in earnest. They need each other, and that's part of it. They need each other to accomplish their ends. All right, so we have a question from the chat from Deborah J. Leslie, who's at the Folger. Um, what was the relationship between the Philadelphia and British abolition societies? Why were the Philadelphia abolitionists invested in pushing the London Society's agenda? Yeah, um, so uh, thank you, Deborah J. Leslie. Um, I, I think that they're, they're trying to achieve a, a moral end, but they also are, have a political program. And I think that they both see that uh, if one can succeed, the other's chance of success are greater. And I, I think it's really that as much as anything, they need a breakthrough case. And uh, at one point, one of the reasons why they lobby the, the, the British abolitionists lobby the French so profoundly uh, after the French Revolution is because they think that could be the case. But then France goes so far politically that they become anathema and that's not going to be it. But the abolitionists are looking for a kind of a, a breakthrough case that they can, uh, a kind of a proof of concept that they can shame their, their political masters with. And so, um, so they exchange when needed money, certainly print, they exchange personnel transatlantically quite regularly. And this becomes part of the, the ordinary transatlantic business network that they're building on as well. Thank you. This is another question. I think that picks up on the first in-room question about the relationship of the network you're describing to pre-existing Quaker networks. I think it makes sense to emphasize the continuity there, but you also talk about it as a secularized kind of form of what's going on. So what is changing as it transitions from a Quaker network to a broader network beyond just scale? Are there actual changes we could describe as secularization? Is there anything lost or gained um, in that transition to a broader print campaign? That's an excellent question. And I think that the, the principal answer is that they're not controlled by the yearly meeting. 
right? The, the committee for sufferings no longer has to answer to the annual yearly meeting. And so, and so they, can, they can go by their own political lights in a, much, in a much more untrammeled, untethered way. And that gives them a, a political a labile quality that they didn't have before. Um, it is true that the Quakers themselves filed the first petition before the commons. It is true that the Quakers themselves um, print and send printed matter, which they present to the King of England. So, so they're, they're, not, they're not unschooled in playing the political game, but by bringing in people like Granville Sharp and William Wilberforce, um, they're much more able to play the game in the commons and the lords. They're much more able to um, enlist a, a much broader group of men and women to support what they're doing. For example, while it's only a Quaker enterprise, the Baptists look on, but when it becomes a secularized enterprise open to all, the Baptist community, particularly in the South of England, really comes to the fore. The Methodist community very much comes to the fore. I mean, uh, John Wesley himself had written an important essay against slavery and the slave trade. So, um, so I think that it opens the door in important ways. Um, question from the chat from Miles Ogborn. My reading of Dixon's diary is that it is as much about discussing abolitionist politics with those in Scotland, the same is true of Clarkson, et cetera, as the distribution of print. What is the role of speech in relation to print? Also, perhaps the blaze, not blare of evidence in the sharp letter. Yes. So that is absolutely true. In, in the diary that I gave you an excerpt from, he says, I went to this meeting. I tried to talk to these men. Um, didn't make any headway because some were very strongly against. I went to this other community, was able to make uh, convincing arguments. Uh, in the fly leaf to that diary is a set of talking points and rules for, for his behavior. themselves without this outsider, quite frankly, present. So he's going to start conversations, but those conversations are not always um, uh, victorious conversations. And um, one of the one of the light motifs of the of the diary too is how terrible the roads are in Scotland, and and how how much difficulty he has getting from A to B to C as he's trying to have these discussions, but also very concretely as he's trying to um, reach a point where they've they've sent him more printed objects for his distribution. So so that becomes really important. Thanks, thanks, Michael. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, I wanted to ask a kind of anti-secularist question about the possibility of what the kind of work you're doing shows about a vast range of printing that isn't for profit. And what I'm thinking about is a long history there that would start with things like briefs in England where at the end of a sermon in the 16th century, they would actually collect funds very often to release prisoners, you know, from the Mediterranean, but also to sort to give away books or to encourage the audience to buy books for poor people like Stowe who who gone bankrupt. Um, so there's a long history there, and then thinking forwards to things like the American Sunday School um, Union, which which Connie King has done so much work on, where it's a vast network of you know global network, a really global network. Um, that extends to China, you know, all over the world, uh, which isn't for profit. And so I'm wondering what the challenges are for, for, for reconceptualizing book history outside a kind of rather narrow economic model in which publishing is for profit, whereas this is a very different model. It's actually, it's, it's a monetary distribution, but it's subscriptions that you're aiming for. And you're aiming for committed people who 
are part of the distribution network. So it's very different from what I'm thinking of just a bookseller. You know, a bookseller needs to market their books, they need to advertise their books. These are people who want to advertise. And the final thing is that to what extent is this also a challenge to the notion of authorship as we normally conceptualize it, which we now tend to conceptualize it about someone wanting to make money, where the very opposite is the case. You want people to republish, you don't want you don't want to own the copy. You want the opposite. You want to give away copy as far as you can. You actually want to, you know, say reprint. Don't pay me. Uh, you know, uh, get it out. Yeah, there's a lot there, Peter. But um, for instance, with authorship, the Dean of Middleham's letter, the letter to the treasurer of the society that goes from, you know, 16 pages to big, you know, 5.75 sheet pamphlet. Um, it's really the product of a kind of a corporate authorship. And one of the things I think is important is that we need to think about some of those authors' names as, as you know, not necessarily saying that they wrote it, but they're licensing it because the committee, I think members of the committee and particularly people like Clarkson are having a hand in doing that. There's also a lot of print that's anonymous you know, the work of groups of, of men and women that uh, are re is really important, but don't have author tags on them. They're just from the committee or from this group or from this society. And that becomes increasingly important too. But yeah, this is, this is not a for-profit enterprise at all. It's, it's for a whole nother purpose. Um, after the, the reconvening of the committee in the early 19th century, most of, the, most of the printing activity is left to individuals and booksellers and not to the committee itself. So, so the strategy changes quite radically over time. All right, we have a question from Jessica Linker. Michael, there's been a lot of recent work that recenters the abolitionist movement around black actors. Manisha Sinha's work maybe being recent and maybe best known. I know you see this as moving away from great men to transatlantic networks, but I'm curious if focusing on print coming from these particular groups in that way is eliding those voices. So I was wondering if you could speak more about the role of black abolitionists in this process. Sure, um, thank you, Jessica. I think the Sons of Africa become particularly important set of actors. Um, there, are, there are probably about 20 of these men who form a, a kind of an ad hoc corresponding society. And they use the newspapers uh, very wisely and well. Uh, Kuguano is a member of this. Equiano is a member of this. Um, I, I listed some of them here. And, I, I, don't, I don't think that we really know enough about the Sons of Africa, although the scholarship is becoming, is becoming better over time. Those voices are increasingly being heard. It, it's also the case, I think, that um, there are Black voices that figure into this conversation that aren't abolitionist per se, but become important as part of the landscape. For instance, the remarkable subscription edition of the letters of Ignatius Sancho in 1782, after he dies in 1780, becomes a kind of a, a, a proof of concept for that, that the black man in uh, England after the Somerset case can be uh, cultured, learned, able and um, able to move in social circles. Uh, and this case sadly needs to be proved and Sancho proves it in those letters, so much so that there are 1200 subscribers to his posthumous letters and between the subscribers and the selling of the copyright, his widow benefits to, to the tune of about 500 pounds. So, um, I think that there are, there are multiple voices. We mentioned the Countess of Huntington earlier and her patronage becomes uh, very important, not just for Phyllis Wheatley, but for a number of black writers. And again, those aren't abolitionist voices, but they become really important part of the resonance 
of print that's that's surrounding this issue and um, probably needs to be brought more to the fore. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, a lot of what you're speaking about is people and paper and the way that's exchanged uh, across the oceans. Um, sort of building upon the previous question, was there ever like samizdat sort of pamphlets or things that are going back across you know the ships and going back even to Africa uh, along you know with sailors or was this entering the discourse of people who are participating back into uh, the other parts of the triangle? It's a really interesting question. When we have the Haitian Revolution, the which starts in August of ninety one, the West Indian planters will say that it's occasioned by the abolition societies whose print products make it to the islands. I haven't found any proof of that, but um, there's some evidence that the, the name Wilberforce becomes a kind of a byword for the possibility of freedom. And whether that's through the power of oral transmission, as was asked by one uh, questioner who was thinking about Dixon's diary, um, or whether that's through the distribution of print, it's very hard to know because the historical record is really lacking there. Um, but I think the question you ask is an important one. Uh, I don't know the answer, but I do think that the power of this idea that Wilberforce will be the great emancipator um, is, is a, a bright red thread that begins to run, particularly post-Haitian post Revolution, that becomes increasingly important. How is that transmitted? I'm going to guess more by oral culture and by song than, than by, by the conveyance of print would be my, would be my, my guess. But it's very difficult to know. I think we'll take one more question from Zoom and then we will conclude our evening here. Okay, so this comes from Susan Garfinkel. Please mention that many of the wealthy Philadelphia Quaker merchants, including for example, James Pemberton, whose name appeared a couple of times, were essentially loyalists. Without getting too complicated, I wonder if you could elaborate a bit on the multiple strands of Quaker network that might have been at play wealthy merchants, religious leaders, for example, traveling friends, et cetera. My larger question is whether the experience of being colonial for American Quakers didn't in fact help them understand how to mount a successful political campaign. For example, they were attacked mightily during pamphlet wars in the 1760s, let alone in the 17th century. I think that's right. And uh, I think that's very percipient. And, and I think that, um, one example of that is not about the question of abolition per se. It's, it's about the, the Philadelphia base of advocacy for the quote unquote red Indian, which, which becomes a really important aspect of the work that Quakers in Philadelphia are doing. Um, over a period of many decades. And I think that very likely having been a politically oppressed people themselves, enlivens them to the plight of the so-called red Indian, the Native American, uh, that then leads them to marshal their forces uh, for a kind of a slow moving but persistent advocacy campaign. So yes, I think that not only the experience of being colonials, but also, the uh, experience of being a disenfranchised people as, as uh, being nonconformists who are treated with derision and scorn by many of the American public and many of the British public very likely enlivens them to the need to, um, it's hard to understand the mentalite, but I think probably the point is very well taken. Uh, that, that the experience of colonialism and the experience of disenfranchisement um, helps to equip them for the moral campaigns that they wage uh, with, with great persistence. 
I think that should be our last question. I could not conclude without thanking our tech support. I wanna thank Doug Smullins, uh, Betsy Deming and Chris Lippa for your exemplary work. If this happened at all tonight, it happened because of their hard labors in this, the first uh, lecture of 2021. And I think we should give them a hand. And I would like to remind everyone that there's a wonderful little pop-up exhibit across the way in the Lee Library. And I'd like us all to give a final round of applause to Michael Suarez.